they were very wealthy, as I explained to you last time. Uh, and I suppose what they gave us was like getting crumbs off the table. But the point is, it's easy to say that if you're not starving. But when you're starving, those crumbs mean everything. Another thing is the fact that I think that uh, Mrs. Hagerman just considered us her private charity. I don't think she had a very happy life. I don't think so. And you know, I have found out since I've grown up that it is more blessed to give than to receive. There's no bigger joy that I've ever had than to give something to somebody who really appreciates it. And so perhaps that's the reason she did it, but they did a lot for us when we really needed the help. And when we wouldn't have made it, I don't think, in that cold climate without their help. And so they did. Um, that meant food, that meant clothing, and that also meant mental material because they gave us a lot of books too. As soon as they found out that the children were all very intelligent and that the father was so intelligent and so forth. They helped us in a lot of ways. And so, I'm not going to talk about them a long time, though, because I want to get into this. Uh, for an example, though, they had two daughters, Eleanor and Anne, who were about the same age as my older sister, Kimball. They were all in that group. Eleanor and Anne considered Kimball their best friend, and uh, they wanted to take her to school with them. And the school, of course, wouldn't allow a little black kid come, coming, and so Mrs. Hagerman sent her daughters to France to finishing school because she was angry about that. These are the kinds of things I'm saying that go a little bit farther than just giving you a little bit of money. Uh, my my mother my my mother was helped during some of her births with Mrs. Hagerman being there when she actually had children. That wasn't necessary. Mrs. Hagerman did it. Okay. Her name was Mel Hagerman and she um, my baby sister Bobby was named after. But those were the Hagermans. Somehow or another, I think when it suns, it shines. <laughs> when it rains, it pours, and when it suns, it suns, it shines. <laughs> because after Miss Hagerman came Tom Jones, or whatever his name was, we don't know really, who was the white fellow that gave Father his horse and wagon. Because you see, Father was sh uh, shoveling coal into coal carts. I told you about that. And finally, they got a machine, and he lost that job, and he had nowhere to go and nowhere to turn. So along comes Miss Hagerman. And then along comes his Tom Jones and gives Father, uh, lets Father buy the horse and wagon on time. And Father, having a horse and wagon, then got on his own. Okay. And he was able to haul ashes because, you know, in Colorado it gets very, very cold. And in Colorado Springs it does. And at that time everybody used coal for heat. Uh, gas wasn't used and electricity wasn't used. And so that creates ashes, and the ashes have to be moved away. And so Father started his ash hauling business. He started out by hauling baggage and things like that, but pretty soon he was into hauling ashes because that is where the money was because you have to do it. Okay, so it's a very dirty and it's a very hard job, but it was the beginning of our being able to come alive and to, to, to do what we did was those ashes and that old horse and wagon that he had. The horse's name was George and we'll never forget it. And George was not treated well like a horse should be treated because they were too poor. But my father used to go with that horse and he would start as early in the morning as he could see and he would come down, come back home after sundown when it was dusk. And he would come home and he would sit at the table and he was never, never, never too tired to work with his children when he got home. Now I want to tell you about my mother and my father because they were the important people. My father was extremely intelligent. Well, extremely intelligent. I have been a school teacher, you know, and I know about intelligence in people. I had to study uh, some psychology, etc. And if he were given a, a BNA, if they had one at that time, and they didn't, I think he would have had an IQ of around 170, 160 or 70. It was way above 130. My mother was a very good wife and a beautiful mother. Um, she had only, as I told you, gone about to the fourth grade in school, 
and she had been reared by grandparents, not grandmother, and she had a very hard life. But I believe there was a love affair between those two people that lasted as long as they were together. I don't know. But I can tell you this, I never heard a crossword between them, never. And I don't think any of the rest of us did. If they, I know they had arguments, they must have had, but they kept it away from us. My father had that kind of mentality. They kept it away from us, and what we had was in that kind of peace. Oh, we fought among ourselves. The kids did. <laughs> and I think that they actually encouraged it in some ways, because, you see, then that would keep us able to <laughs> go out into the world and fight the world, you <laughs> see. <laughs> and they didn't bother. That didn't worry them. Uh, in fact, and then she called him Mr. Stroud. That meant she was, she was a little bit teed off about something. <laughs> he was Mr. Stroud then, but that's all I know. Anyhow, I do know this. They were devoted to their children, absolutely devoted. And I know they made tremendous sacrifices for us. Now, Mama bore 11 children, and not one of us had the doctor except him, Bobby. And he was born, he came after Bobby was born. She actually delivered two or three of us by herself without nobody there. That's how strong she was. Uh, she showed, she told me all what all you had to do when a baby was born was to be sure you tied both ends of the umbilical cord and cut, them, cut it in the middle. I know that my oldest sister Kimball delivered me, and I had a little trouble with my navel uh, because she didn't quite get the band right. But after, that got straightened. Um, sometimes, and that's where the Colbert family comes in, the Colbert family of Colorado Springs lived across the street from us, and sometimes the older girls would help her. And I'm talking about Etta Colbert, who is the mother of the gang of Colbert, Colbert yes, Etta, and Rena, who is the uh, mother of the Flores kids, and um, the other one, Laura, who is the mother of the mascot kids. They sometimes came out in and helped mom. Miss Hagerman came down the center. But she had all 11 us children that I didn't really in, in care. Because father was gone, working all the time. Now, not only that, but I never remember mama sitting down to the table and eating with us. And I asked her once why she didn't eat with us. And she says, I want to be sure you will have enough before I eat. That's the kind of mother I had. I don't remember in my life the time when my mother wasn't home when I came home. Now, <laughs> there are times, I guess, when the older sisters and brothers, when she had to be away, I suppose. But when I was growing up, never, ever was Mama not home when I came home. That's even after I grew up and got married. <laughs> she was still there. Now, this was a mother. Um, she taught us a lot of things. I remember she taught me for example, that the moss grew on the north side of trees. She learned all of these things as a, growing up as an Indian. All right. She taught me how to make fire with a flint and steel. She taught me how to make fire with rubbing sticks together. I didn't learn in the Girl Scouts because we weren't allowed in the Girl Scouts. You see, uh, she taught me how to find the kind of weeds, and she used to take us down the road to find weeds that she could cook as greens, I mean edibles. And I found out that she also, from my mother, that she watched the birds, what they eat. You know, eat anything they want. This is the kind of mother she was. Um, she, it used to take uh, three good days to wash clothes in our house because of the primitive conditions under which they had to be washed. Remember, when I was a little girl, people didn't have washing machines, so you used a big laundry tubs and he washed it on the board and that's what she did. She even washed my father's uh, ash clothes that way. Well, that's terribly hard. So she'd wash all day long, do this all day long, and then we'd have to boil them on the stove because she couldn't get them all exactly clean. So we would boil them on the stove. They didn't have bleach in those days. They didn't have uh, Clorox and stuff like that. She went, okay, I could talk forever about those conditions. But you would have to understand that they were primitive and that washing for 11 people is very difficult. Especially when it was very hard to keep us clean because there were so many of us in one little space. She would get on her hands and knees and scrub the floor, the kitchen floor, try to get it just as white as she could. She made light soap herself. 
I showed us how to make lye. And I do know that lye is ashes and water. Okay, <laughs> so this she do that. And, oh, well, my mother. That was a mother. I've never seen her smile very, very much. She laughs sometimes. She was usually, she's usually pretty uh, stern. And she never um, yelled at us or screamed. It didn't happen. She just told us one time, and we better do it. And then it was just her whole demeanor. So, that's the kind of mother she was. And she was a complete and wonderful mother. Imagine every kind of childhood disease that you can going through that house because there were so many of us. And Mama nursing every one of us and staying up all night if she had to, rocking us or whatever. And so she did. I was sick once when I was very, very small. I was sick for six weeks. And the doctor, they did get a doctor there somehow or other because I didn't, it didn't look as if I was going to get well. All my hair came out and I couldn't walk and I couldn't talk. And this is when I was very small because I don't remember. But I do have scars on my lips right here that I got from picking my lips when I was little. Uh, Mama nursed me through that. And she did have a doctor. But I survived. So, that's the kind of mother you have. Now, uh, my father. Let me get to him. And it's kind of hard for me to get to him because I get kind of emotional about him because he did so much for us. Now, he was, this is the reason why I say he was so intelligent. I want you to understand that first. The reason I say he was so intelligent is because of what he used to do with us to train us to be smart kids. Because of the respect he had for education and knowledge. Now, we were poor folks, even when he started to work with the ashes. We still weren't affluent. We were never affluent. Things got better and better and better for us all the time. They did. But um, as I grew up, these are the kinds of things, experiences that we had. He would give us problems to work. We were in elementary school then, you know. He would give us problems to work that really required algebra to do. I mean the problems like um, you got one train here and you got one train there and one goes this this um, number of um, of um, miles per hour. miles per hour and that goes that miles per hour and so forth and so on. Okay. Um, yeah, I can get it. <laughs> you go so many miles per hour and when do they meet or where do they meet or that kind of thing, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. He would give us a week to work the problem, <laughs> two weeks. You know, and he would give a prize to whoever got it first. Mm -hmm. Give us those kinds of things. He kept books. Now, we were poor people, but we had an encyclopedia. I don't think he bought it, though. I think somebody gave it to him. I'm not sure, but it wasn't uh, the world book. It was either the Oxford Encyclopedia or the Encyclopedia Britannica. I don't know. It was one of those. It was a whole set we had. We had books all over the place. Um, the Hagemans gave us books. The school teachers gave us books. We, our greatest uh, joy was going to the library on Saturday. So we could come home with loads of books. I used to read through an author like Edna Ferber, everything she wrote, you know, like Willa Cather, everything she wrote, like Thornton W. Burgess. We read all the stories about the animals, you know. You got uh, uh, Reddy the Fox and Jimmy the Skunk and Woody the Woodpecker and Peter Rabbit, you know, the whole thing. Well, then when you got a little older, you read Zane Grey all through, you know. Another thing is when we had coil on lamps. And we had coil lamps and didn't even have electricity yet. We used to sit in the living room after supper with the coil lamps on, and Tandy or Dolphus or somebody who was in high school or college would read these marvelous things to us, like Ben Hur and like Les Miserables. Now, my father called that Les Miserables, <laughs> See? and he called the he called the main character Jean Valjean. Jean Valjean, but anyway, that's what he called him in France. Oh my, I won't forget that. These kinds of things, the Pilgrim's Progress, and we read poetry. My father was a poet himself. You know. uh, he wrote poetry, 
He wrote little rhymes for us to use at school. He made up plays for us to, to do perform. Um, he was an intellect. Now, as a teacher, I realized that he used many techniques just to develop our minds. For an example, when we went to school, when I went to the store to get something to eat, my mother would give me maybe a dollar and say, all right, now 90, she said, because they called me 90, which I'll come get into later. 90, you want to go to the store, and here's a dollar, Now I want you to bring me back 40 cents, and I need some sugar and flour. Okay. Now, I figure out how much I've got to spend on flour and sugar and bring me back 40 cents. This is the kind of thing they did to us, and I know it was to expand their minds. I know it now. And how did my dad know that? How did he know that's what we call kids? And so then, another thing that they used to do, they used to, um, well, what father did. After he got through working on his ash trucks or his ash wagon, whatever it was, uh, he would come home at night and we would sit down for dinner and he would sit at the head of the table and he would say the blessing, Lord, forgive us of our sins, make us worthy of these blessings. We ask in Jesus' name, Amen. And then he would say, now who daylighted the class today? In other words, one of us had to be the smartest kid in the class in something. Well, when you've got that kind of motivation, there's nothing for you to do but go to, go to school and achieve, you see. Because when you get home, Father's not going to be happy if somebody hasn't done the best thing in school. See. Uh, then after we finished eating, then he would have us read the newspaper. And he doesn't give us assignments to read in this newspaper, aloud to all of them, uh, according to our abilities. For an example, I started out reading the births and funerals <laughs> in the newspaper. <laughs> and uh, somebody else, of course, would read the vital statistics. The, well, I said that, the vital statistics. Somebody else would read the weather report. Now, at the same time, we were learning about the weather and about, you know, statistics. <laughs> And then somebody else bigger would read the headlines and the news stories. Uh, we read the art editorials too. And we also read the classified advertisements. So we read the whole newspaper. Yeah. And that went on for day. Then after we finished reading the newspaper, he would have us keep his books. Now, he had taught himself to keep books, or perhaps his father did. His father might have, since his father was the overseer of that big plantation. But anyway, it was just a simple, very elementary bookkeeping. His cash account is what he kept, was a cash account. Well, we'd have to put down the names of whomever he worked for and the address and whether it was paid or charged, whether the amount, the amount that was, and we had two columns, paid and charged. And then on Saturdays, it was our job to make out the bills. Um, when we got a typewriter, this began to happen. Uh, and that's when he had trucks get to that later. Uh, we made out the bills, wrote statements is what I'm saying. I'm going to be happy if somebody hasn't done the best thing in school. Let's see. Uh, then after we finished eating, then he would have us read the newspaper. And he doesn't give us assignments to read in this newspaper, aloud to all of them, uh, according to our abilities. For an example, I started out reading the births and funerals <laughs> in the newspaper. <laughs> And uh, somebody else, of course, would read the vital statistics. The, well, I said that, the vital statistics. Somebody else would read the weather report. Now, at the same time, we were learning about the weather and about, you know, statistics. <laughs> and then somebody else bigger would read the headlines and the news stories. Uh, we read the art editorials, too. And we also read the classified advertisements. So we read the whole newspaper. Yeah. And that went on for day. Then, after we finished reading the newspaper, he would have us keep his books. Now, he had taught himself to keep books, or perhaps his father did. His father might have, since his father was the overseer of that big plantation. But anyway, it was just a simple, very elementary bookkeeping. His cash account is what he kept, was a cash account. Well, we'd have to put down the names of whomever he worked for, and the address, and whether it was paid or charged, whether the amount, the amount that was, and we had two columns, paid and charged. And then on Saturdays, it was our job to make out the bills. Um, when we got a typewriter, this began to happen. 
Um, that's when you had trucks to get to that later. Uh, we made out the bills, wrote the statements is what I'm saying. And then we, little kid girls, <laughs> carried them around to the people that he worked for in the town and collected the money. And Father taught us to do that. Now, the reason he did that is in the first place, the town was very small and it was safe. Nobody was going to hurt us. He knew that. The second place, you are a customer, you owe my father some money, you're definitely going to pay these two little girls that come to your house with the bill and, and say, I'm collected from my father. You could have definitely do that. And the third place, it taught us the town, it taught us the streets, it taught us how to get around and how to approach people and how to handle the money and how to know where the money came from and what it was used for. I, he was intelligent. He was intelligent. Now, when he got his first truck, his first uh, wagon, um, then it wasn't too much longer than he had another way and another horse. And a little bit later than that, he had another horse, and he had another horse. Now, I remember four horses. That's as many as he had. And I remember two work wa wagons, and I remember a buggy. And I remember another small wagon that him, Adolphus, and Tandy used to go with, and used to use, and Kimball sometimes, to get around, and to go to school and stuff. I remember that. Um, we had George and Lefton, who were the workhorses, and then we had Molly, who was the carriage horse. We had a buggy. And then we had Dimples, who was Molly's coat. And Dimples was sold for a racehorse. And uh, Molly ran away. George and Lefton died. And when George and Lefton both died, because they died uh, close to each other, George died first, and then Lefton just, I yeah, guess, missed George and died. Because he, he went out to the yard, and my father did out to the barn, and we both did. So, there we were, back again to being real poor if we weren't careful. Father didn't know exactly where to turn. And that's where I must go back to this sister of my of my mother's. Now, I thought I had her up here close, well, mm -hmm. but I don't. I don't have her as close as I thought I had her. Well, it would be very easy for me to find her because she was very important. Yes, she yes. and Mrs. Hayden. Now, the two of them together. Sister appeared. Now, sister had left Colorado Springs, um, and then, but she just came back now and then to see us. And she appeared and she gave my father the down payment for a truck. And my father was on his way. On his way. Uh, when she appeared, I think I told you that she she um, did tricks in carnivals. Did I tell you that, well? Oh, fortunes. Yeah, she, and then she also did tricks. Oh. She and her husband followed carnivals. You know, carnivals that we had in our day were like fairs that you have nowadays. Um, they had booths, they had tents. People would come and with tents, the performers, and they would have uh, various kinds of uh, things that you don't see often, like the big fat lady or, or the, the skinny man or something like that. And this woman would have her own tent with her husband. He was the barker outside that was getting people to come and watch her act. And what she would do was um, get in a trunk and get all locked up so she couldn't get out, you know, no way to get out. But she would get out. You know, I kind of like you say magic tricks that she would do. And then she would tell fortunes. One time they came to our house and they came periodically. We never knew when they were going to show up. But they'd just show up maybe once a year, maybe twice a year. Once, uh, when she came to our house, they, they had um, the first trailer I've ever seen in my life. It was a truck and the back was converted, converted into a trailer. That is, the back was their home. Mm -hmm. And they had, you know, had it like a little house on the window. And she had a little stove in there and a little ice box. Because, you know, we didn't have refrigerators. We had ice boxes. And so she had an ice box and a table and a bed. And it was just a little home. Well, people from all over town came to her yard to get her to tell their fortunes. <laughs> she told their fortunes. 
They also had these English bulldogs that they they uh, bred. One time they came with a gang of those, and they bred them and they sold them for a whole lot of money. I don't know how much, but <laughs> she had a lot of money, and she carried it in a bag, <laughs> a big bag, around her neck a lot of times, uh, and she only had gold coins and gold certificates. That's all she carried. So she would give us five dollar gold pieces and I don't know what happened to mine, but I had one once. And Lula says she still has hers, but I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, she was very generous to us because every time they came, they came with something for us. I know once they came with a whole hog, a live hog. And my father butchered that hog in the backyard, and mom and father sold some of that meat. Mm -hmm. You know, they came and they left us with something. And so she came, and father needed needed uh, uh, to have something to work with, and she was really, I think, really pleased that you know he was doing so well. And she bought, she gave him the down payment, and he finished paying for that truck. No. Well, it didn't take him too long to finish paying for it. Because when we got our house, it cost $600. And he, they were, then we were really, really poor. And uh, he paid for it in 24 months, as poor as he was. Now, that's the kind of dad I had, and that's the kind of mother I had. But they had this kind of beautiful help on the way, too. Um, so, s sister, as I say, came up by periodically. Then she stopped coming entirely. I don't think Rosa has ever seen her. Maybe, maybe I don't think Rosa could be there, because I can only get a little. But um, she stopped coming entirely, and then one day my sister Lula got a call. This is after we were grown and were married and all. I was, it was in the 50s, because my child was maybe four years old, so it was about 54 or 55. My sister Lula got a call from in, in her house. And we were all there for some gathering of some kind. And this woman talked to her from Arkansas. And we all figured it must have been sister. Because Lula only heard a few words in English. And then she went off into this Creek Indian language. And she must have been terribly old because all she would say, and she would repeat it over and over again, I am Princess, I Princess Azuzina, and I am I am of the Creek Indian tribe, and I this and I that of the Indians. And she was just talking mostly in Creek and a little bit of English here and there. Lula could not make head or tail of it. And she tried to get a number to call back to her, but she couldn't. And so that's all we know. But we think that was sister. Mm -hmm. We think she called she called information from Arkansas, because the call came from Arkansas. And she thinks she she called information to Colorado Springs and as for Lulu, as for Lulu Stroud, that would have been her sister. Lulu was my mother's name. Mm -hmm. See, she was Lulu. And my sister is also named Lulu. So, uh, I think she was trying to get Lulu Stroud. And being such a small town and everyone in town knew the Stroud family, the operator probably just said it to be what we figured. Anyway, that was, that was sister. Now, to get back to us. Um, I think I've just about told you the kind of, of parents I had. had I, if you have a question, well, if you have some input, you do that. I'm trying to think of anything else I could have told you about my father, excepting that he was a poet. And of course, that's another sign of intelligence. You may not know that. But it is. And he was a very religious man also. He used to have dreams, and he said, were visions. They may have been, they may not have been. But he was an interpreter of dreams, too. One time, he came down, and my older sister, older brother told me, this office told me this in his writings. He came down, after, you know, after he slept all night, he came downstairs. And he um, went right away to the table and wrote this song that I'm going to show you now. My father was so smart that he never, he, he got our school books and found out how to write down notes and, and rests and things and music, and so he could write down a line of music, a melody. And he had never had any music in his whole life. 
And he made up songs, I told you that, I think. Mm. And so he wrote this, The Anthem of Heaven. I guess I'll do that. That one. And I'm going to play it for you because my sister Bobby and I made this recording of it. That's no new to ground. All, all of us knew it because Father sang it. But he wrote that after he had been sleeping all night. And then he put down the notes. As I say, he got the notation from our school books. So let's let's hear. Uh oh, I didn't get that on right. Oh, let's hope I get this right. Okay. No neutral ground to heaven. Okay, I just about got it. I'm well, I don't get it. I'll get it for you. It's got it. There we go. This is an old fashioned thing, but I use it because it sounds so much better to me than a tape. There I got it now. Bobby's playing the organ, and I'm playing the piano and singing. Yeah. 
Yeah, put this on. I have it on the tape. Yeah, because he, he was, he was, as I say, he was, you know, one of these people that you don't believe. We may never. Uh, a lot of people won't be able to hear this. I mean, other than by the tape. I know. Well, I'll, I'll tell you. I got, you know, you can make all kinds of tapes. I got these. I got two, three more discs. Well, then, uh, if you want them. Well, what we do, we put it on the tape and we have it. But so you can make all kinds of tapes from this. I mean, that's that's very simple. But um, you know, most people don't even have forty-five. You can't. No, but I, I'm trying to say you make the tape off of forty-five. Right. I can make a lot of tapes. But. But they oh, don't dear. have on the newer on the newer record players. People don't even have that. They don't have that capacity. No, they you can't. Oh, yeah, well, I'll have to do it. I have to make you an original <laughs> tape. I'll have to make you a master tape. Okay, so this is you must get ready to. You must get ready to die as the one. Well, then this isn't called. You must get ready to call. Chicago was still another. We had four good trucks, four good Ford trucks, and we had a business. My father hired people. I'm trying. We progressed, is what I'm saying. By the time I was in um, tenth grade, I guess, well, not tenth grade. I mean, by the time I was ten years old, is what I'm trying to say. Um, he had the four trucks running. We had people working for us. Our making out the bills was a job because we had that many customers in town. He went to the city council, my father did, and asked them to give him a contract for the city to haul ashes all over the city. He and my brothers, Dolphus and Tandy and Albert and those guys, had the idea that if we had the cans that we all use now for garbage, we had smaller cans, they could pick up the whole town's cans 
and have a contract with the city to do it. And come to everybody's house once a week and pick up your ashes, you see, and then charge them once a month. Uh, and do it in small cans so they wouldn't have that terrible job of cleaning ash pits. Because ash pits were huge uh, concrete or cement things that um, people put ashes in the, you know, in, and put them in the top and then there was a door in the bottom and the guys would come around and shovel the ashes out into the truck. That was a very hard job and it was also a very dirty job because you see the ashes are going to fly around and get in your nose, your mouth, your eyes, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And they said, well, we could come around every week and pick up ashes, just go up and down the streets, and wouldn't they give Father the, the contract? And of course, the city council laughed him out. You know, the idea of an old nigger man, you understand, poor black man, um, I thinking he had, you know, to, to have that idea was beyond them. And so they just laughed him out of the, out of the room and wouldn't pay any attention to them. So my father decided to do it on his own. And we were getting close to it because we had a lot of customers that were monthly customers uh, and who had cans and whom they picked up ashes from and trash that way. And uh, the guys, my boys, you see I have all these five brothers and they were busy uh, getting contracts with the uh, commercial interests downtown, the hotels, you know, the restaurants and things to pick up their ashes and trash and whatever. We didn't pick up garbage because that was the city's contract, and they did have that with a white fella to pick up the garbage, but they couldn't give the old trash man, who was a black nigger, and who couldn't possibly have that much sense to give him that job. But anyway, he was he was growing, and he was going to be very, well, like waste management, I think, is what he had on his mind. We had the four trucks going, we had people hired, the girls were doing all the bookkeeping and that and collecting the bills. The boys were supervising all the work because father would not allow his boy, boys to stop school. No way. And so that was when they were, uh, on Saturdays or after school, they would do maybe help a little bit, but never to interfere with their lessons. And then we had, gar we had a, a junkyard in the backyard because you see, what you call recyclables now, we call junk. And my father would sell junk on the side. He'd pick it up, you know, from wherever he was picking up trash, and then he would sell it to it. The wholesaler, the junk wholesaler at that time, was a man named Superstein. He was a Jew. And he would come around on Sunday and buy father's junk, you see. Now that, to me, makes much more sense than what cities are trying to do now. Because private enterprise does do things more efficiently. And you see, if you have people going around picking up junk from everybody's house, recyclables, then it's no big problem. You don't have to separate anything. That's what the junk man does, mm -hmm. and the wholesaler. And the wholesaler finds out where to sell your junk. You see. Anyhow, that's what he did. And then, what else did we have going for us? <laughs> we did manure, too, and that was real good in the, in the springtime because everybody needed manure. And then all of us worked at some kind of job, too, so things were going pretty well. I remember the times, naturally, when, um, well, when we had chicken every Sunday. And chicken was a big thing, <laughs> fried chicken, you know, for us black people. <laughs> and uh, everybody in town who wanted to come over to our house and eat could do it. I mean to say they didn't, but I'm saying all our friends, if our friends came over and then they were there at night and we were going to have supper, well, there was always enough for them, too. That was because of my father. His background was the South, you understand. And he didn't believe in eating anything in front of company unless he invited them to eat. Uh, Mama went downtown on Saturday and she bought us new clothes for Sunday. Every Sunday. So there was, we had a piano. Now, that I think was given to us. Um, my sister, my older sister, had a violin and was taking violin lessons. Now, Kimball didn't need to take violin lessons because Kimball was tone deaf, <laughs> but she had a violin. Mama wanted all of her children to have music sing, and she tried. My brother Albert still can't sing a tune, but I believe he's dead now, of course he can't, but I mean, he couldn't sing a tune. Few of us were musical, though, and so she tried to give music to all of us. Davos could play the piano if he sang real well and pretty well anyway. 
I don't think Effie ever had an instrument for him. Um, Tandy had drums. Mm. But he couldn't <laughs> sing. He couldn't <laughs> sing, but he had drums. Uh, Jack could sing. And Jack could tap dance, too. Jack was a very good dancer. James had a trombone. When Lula and Rosa and Bobby and I came along, cause we were the youngest, the four girls, Mama was trying then to give us piano lessons, all of us. And I remember when uh, Rosa and Bobby and I were taking lessons. Now, this is not to be boastful, uh, well, it's just a fact, that I had more talent than all of them and stuff. And I think all of them realized it. But Mama was a very fair person, and she didn't. She didn't give me any more than she gave the rest of them. So anyway, um, we all had lessons. All right, we had good food and we had plenty of it. But father and mother, mama were so in, interested in seeing that the kids had everything that they didn't much do much for themselves still. And so I wouldn't say that ours was the prettiest house in town, but we did have adequate space in it. Your father, your father, Tandy, bought us an electric washing machine. That I won't forget, because that was really wonderful. That's, that happened on the way up, you know. Um, and we had, didn't have to do this anymore. And though, as I said, we had a kitchen that was decent. We had the hot water heater and that kind of thing. We got a toilet. Did I tell you, I remember when Bobby was born, I remember because when she was ready to be born, everybody knew we had to have more space. And so that's when two back rooms were put on our house, but then is when father was doing well too. So I remember the carpenters coming over and building those two back rooms. And this, they, they would build uh, laths and plaster it was in the wall, you know, instead of drywall. And so here was this carpenter pulling a nail out of his out of his mouth and harming her. And he was going so fast with his hammer and his, he put a nail out of his mouth and then hammer and he hammered, hammer, 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 hammer. And I remember that when I was small. Bobby was born in our new kitchen. Uh, we had in our kitchen a decent range. We had a um, um, hot water tank. We had hot, cold running water to sink. And in the second room, which was called a, a back room, it was our back bedroom, there were stairs to go up to the attic. Heretofore, uh, the men slept in the attic, the boys and the fathers slept in the attic, but they had to go through the front bedroom up some stairs that were in a closet that were really very good stairs. But now we had an open stairway going upstairs to the attic where the boys were and the men. And at the base of those stairs, we had a toilet. We didn't have a full bathroom, but we did have a toilet inside. This is how we progressed. Later on, then there were two more rooms on the back, the two more back porches, you might say, and we had a full bathroom before the two back porches came on. We had a tub and all the rest of it. But these were the stages we went through. Now, and then we had a furnace later on still, and um, that was under the house. And first of all, it was coal, and then it was converted to gas. Uh, we had electricity, too, that, that was put into it. And this is what happened as we grew. Now, Father was about to the point now where he was ready to really make a palace for Mama to live in. Because he said, the next year Mama's going on your house because he had all his trucks paid for. And he was getting ready to really do things, and that's when he went blind. Before he went blind, he, had, he was not working on the trucks anymore. He was going around getting the jobs, making the contacts, and doing that kind of thing. And he went blind. He went blind from glaucoma. They didn't know what to do with glaucoma in those days. We do now. But nowadays you don't have to go blind because they have these advances, in, as all medicine has. Uh, we tried to save his eyes. He tried to save it, but it was not possible. He was operated on another number of times. I mean to say his eyes were punched through these pressure, pressure. And he went through terrible pain trying to keep his eyes, but he didn't. After he was blind, he um, also, he learned things anyway. He learned to type after he was blind. He learned to play the piano after he was blind. So you see what I'm saying about it, right? And he never stopped learning. 
He still wanted to know what was going on. Screen. He still wanted us to read things to him. And he kept that going. And that's when he did preach a little while. <laughs> after, after he got blind, then he preached a little bit more. Um, he became assistant pastor at Trinity Church. Before he was blind, he wouldn't preach. He wouldn't try to preach because on Sunday he was busy trying to make money on his junk. He said there wasn't a church in town, or not a black church. You understand it had to be in context of a black church. Uh, he said there wasn't a church in town that was able to support him and his family. And he was absolutely right. Eleven of us, we wouldn't starve to death. So um, he went back to preaching a little. And then he died of a cerebral hemorrhage and uh, hardening of the arteries. And that was the result of high blood pressure. And that, as we know now, has a lot to do with diet, has a lot to do with cholesterol, and so forth and so on. But in those days, they didn't know about all these things. All right. He died in 1938. I was a soft, I was a junior. I was a junior in college. No, I was a sophomore when he died. Now, Mama lived on for quite a while. I want to get now into the rest of us. And you so, have a picture there of the death. Yes, I've showed that, that several picture, times. Yeah. And I didn't that bring it was, out because... That was the gathering <coughs> uh -huh. when he died. I can show you again. Yeah, we've okay. seen that before, yeah. but it, it wouldn't hurt to, to show kind it of just show it in, in Oh, and I do want to show this other one, too. Of, um, Let me get this one out, too. I want to show you that. Yeah, and I had it right on top, so I could get it out, too. What's the matter, you cold thoughts? No, you got a cough. I don't know. Yeah. You got a cough and that's there. it. Yeah. That's this the is, picture of the funeral. funeral. After he died, this is what. Oh, it'd be so good if I could remember that. But well, I, I, listen, I'm going to show you when we finish which calendar Lula put in it. You people have every single picture I've shown you except a few. And I also can get you a copy of this. I mean, a copy of a Xerox so you can get a copy of it. I may have another one. I have it there. now. Yeah. When I have this tape, well, I have it. See, once it's on that tape, you have it. we have it. And yeah. we can always take that tape and make a photograph. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Okay, so this is the whole group the, of us. When my father died, and you can't see the office. Right. You can't see it very well. But I have, a, I, don't, yeah, I have a better picture. And this is Albert, my two oldest brothers, my oldest sister, Kimber. That's the best picture I've got of him. I told you that. Mm -hmm. This is Effie. This is Tandy. This is Jack. Okay. This is James, probably the best picture I have. What's the matter with him? This is Lulu. Mm -hmm. This is Nina. This is Rosa. And uh, this is body. The video. Okay, now, okay. this other picture I wanted you to see. Uh, this is one where we were starting when Father had it started with his trucks, had his trucks going. Now, this is a picture of Dolphus. Uh, I think we've probably. Be, yeah, be sure to get this. This I have never seen. This is not really yes, it was. I can show you. Hey, <laughs> Lula has everything on his thing. Wow. And pushed them in, into the calendars. <laughs> this was published in the Crisis magazine, 1928, I think. Oh, really? Yeah, about our family. About my father and his business in Colorado Springs. In the Crisis magazine, uh -huh. 1928. I think something like that. Oh, Luke could tell you exactly. No, I don't think she has a copy of it either. I don't think, I don't have a magazine. Uh, everybody's not here. No, no, I say this was published in the magazine. And it wasn't when my father died or anything. It was mm -hmm. just, the story was published about what this man was doing in Colorado Springs with this business. Uh, the, all of your, all the living children are in this photo? No, no. No way. No, Luke is not even there. Yeah. Oh no, this is just some of us. This is just a picture that was put in the magazine. And, and who's this? That's James. That's James and his little, little fellow. And, this is and that's Dolphus. And that's Jack. 
Jack? No, it's Jack. Oh, now it's not there, he's in Chicago. <laughs> this is the office. No, this is not all of us. Lulu was in hit prayer view somewhere going to college. This is me. Uh -huh. This is Rosa. And this is Bobby. And this is Jay. Uh -huh. We're, this is just a, those of us who were home at the at time, the time of the photographer uh -huh. came. Like no. Yeah, my father was in Washington, D.C. Yeah, but, well, he probably maybe was just working, or maybe he was in school. No, he was I in D.C. Um, Dolphus uh, wrote the story oh. that they put in a crisis I'm about about uh, about what this Stroud family in Colorado Springs was doing, about what his, my father was doing. Mainly it was about being a black businessman. Mm -hmm. That's what it was about. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and about the trucks he had and what he was doing. As I say, he, he was on his way, but he went blind. That's what stopped him. Mm -hmm. And it really hurt him, too, because he was so used to supporting his family and did him so much good. And then he found himself, you know, with nothing. <laughs> All we had then was just the $30 a month he got uh, as a blind pensioner. Because he and my mother never were able to save any money naturally. Right. Not with doing what they were trying to do for us kids. And I don't think they thought in terms of saving really. They just thought in terms of getting these kids out and on their way. Mm -hmm. It's their devotion to us. Anyway, that was in the, in the Crisis magazine. And I did want you to see that before we went on. Yeah. Now, let's, let's go ahead then with, with the rest of the family. I must do that because I do want you to know that part, which I think is almost as important as the other part. Mm -hmm. What 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 was the result of the tremendous sacrifice and the tremendous work they did? Right. It's what you have to see. So I'll start with Kimball. Now, I don't have a really good picture of Kimball. This one here. This is the only one. Okay. And we'll just put that aside. You know, that's okay. So that I can get to Bobby when I need to. This is a picture of Kimball. Here. But then he needs to adjust that. Can't me out. He's here. Okay. So there's the Kimball. They're all of us. This is not bad at all for see. But this is Kimball. Okay, let's start with Kimball. Now, with my glasses. Cut. Okay. Okay. This is Kimball. This is the best picture I think that I have of her. So you can take a look. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now. Let me tell you about her. She was a writer. She was a politician. She married Mr. Goffman, who we saw here. Mm -hmm. And they had two children, Paul and Billy. Paul died when he was only 12 years old, accidentally. And uh, Billy, of course, is still alive. And you know him, Billy Goffman. Now, Kimball was the oldest sister, and she was like my second mother. Uh, life's my first mother. The best doll I ever had in my life was given by Kimball. I still remember it. it was Mary Beth Bell, and she was bigger than I was. I remember when Kimball gave me a little red suit, a little red coat, and little red leggings to go, wet leggings to go with it. And I spent a lot of time in her house when, after she got married. When she was uh, courting, I believe she worked for a family and was their living maid because I now don't remember Kimball's being home. So I think she had already left when I was born to live in as a uh, maid with these white, this white family. She met her husband, she married him. They both lived on the place, as we call it. And he was the chauffeur and she was the cook. And then they got their own house, and uh, then they got another one that they rented, and then they got another one that they rented, and she was well on her way in real estate. She never worked out after uh, she and, and Paul were married. Her husband was named Paul and her oldest child was Paul Jr. Okay. And I used to spend a lot of time in their houses. House. She was a very good cook. Of course, she had been cooking for white people for a long time. She was a very good cook. And I used to love to go over there and get her good food and whatnot. She was good to all of us. Um, she and her husband used to take the kids riding sometime, all of us. He had a Willie's night car, and she used to take us riding sometime. And um, she used to have Thanksgiving dinners. And she had a great big table that she, her husband built so that all of us could sit around the table. And she had the whole family to dinner on Thanksgiving, and we had wonderful times in the house. 
Well, she died very early in 1947. <coughs> she died in childbirth, and her baby died also. And after she died, um, her husband, later on, quite a bit later on, married Maude Goffman. And Maude Goffman uh, adopted Bill. And uh, Maude was a very, very good real estate person herself. Because Bill only had, I guess, about two houses that he had left when his, his sister died, I mean, when his mother died. Uh, shortly after Paul married Maude Goffman, he died also in an accident. And so there's nobody left but Billy and his adopted mother, Maude, who was a good gal, really was. Anyway, she built the real estate empire that they, that they absolutely got together and left it for Bill. So we all have a lot of respect for Maude and Michael very much. She's been dead quite a while. Now, that was Kimball. She, her, 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 what she did was to write and she was also a good politician. Now, she got that from father. We all did, because he was tremendously interested in politics, the whole world. Always interested in the economy. Taught me, my father, about the monetary system, about the gold standard and the silver standard. The father did. So, uh, she got all of that from them, too. And she became a politician, but she became a Democrat. And, uh, of course, father couldn't stand that, because he thought, you washed your hands in Lincoln's blood if you were a Democrat, you understand. But she was, as I say, another generation, and things were different, and of course, she was a Democrat. Now, she wrote all the time. She not only wrote, but she was the hometown distributor for the black Negro newspapers, the Negro newspapers. I'm talking so fast, I'm getting my words messed up. Let me slow down a little bit. She uh, liked the Chicago Defender and the Pittsburgh Courier and the Kansas City Call, the Oklahoma City Black Dispatcher, was it the Tulsa? I don't know. She had all of those in her house, and her boys would distribute them to the people who took the black newspapers. Um, your, your father edited a black newspaper in Colorado Springs, you know. Uh, what was the name of it? Well, we'll get to him when I get to his story. Um, Anyway, she was very active in politics. And what she did was she organized the black people and the Mexicans in Colorado Springs into a political block. Now the Mexicans outnumbered us, uh, outnumbered the blacks. And they do all over Colorado. And they soon will in California, if they don't already. Uh, there were, what, 900 black people and there were 5,000 Mexicans. Do you see what I mean? So when she organized the Mexicans into a voting bloc, which she did, they were able to elect a Democratic governor of the state of Colorado, Johnson. As a result of that activity, while well, she was always, you know, high, you know, always doing political things for the Democratic Party, she was state committee woman, but she was a colored committee woman. You understand what I'm saying? We were still at that level in Colorado. She was the state uh, committee woman for the colored Democrats in Colorado. As a result, she was invited to President uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's inauguration in Washington, D.C. And there's her invitation. Uh, it's, it's hard for you. You can't read it, but I'll have to tell you, read a little bit to you and tell you what it says. I wanted you to see me document first. Um, it was written to her by David Houston, who was a chairman of the Committee on Special Entertainment. And this was the inaugural committee, and this is 1937. Okay? Mm. Now, it says, Dear Mrs. Goffman, Dr. William J. Tompkins of Kansas City, Missouri, recorder of deeds for the District of Columbia, has submitted your name to the Committee on Special Entertainment for enrollment as special guest on the occasion of the inauguration of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Vice President John H. Garner, uh, Garner January the 20th, 1937, which it is hoped will be memorable again as a real triumph, triumph of democracy. And then she says some more, and then it says, please advise us at once if you, or any representative of your club plan to be in Washington for the inauguration. 
address me, Carol, so and so. She said, it says, the Committee on Special Entertainment will act as host to the special guests of the inaugural committee at a theater party, and other similar cur courtesies will be extended to these enrolled uh, guests. We desire to enroll our special guests at the earliest possible moment, and will be alert to every opportunity to add to their convenience, comfort, comfort and entertainment during a stay in the capital of the nation. So that's what she did, uh, besides writing things for the rest of us. I'm not going to go on with all that she has done other than that, because I do want to get through the whole thing, if I can. The next one is Albert. And uh, there he is. And I think I showed you. Uh, is, yeah, Albert. And there he is. Okay. And I have a very special picture of Albert, which I'll show you also. That's this one. Let's take this one down. I won't be using it anymore, I don't think. There he is. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Would you hold it for it again, please? A yes. Okay. There's Jack there in the middle. Mm -hmm. That's when Jack got married, and there is his, his his bride, her father, and her two children. Jack did not marry until late in life. But I'll talk about Jack later. I want to tell you about Do Albert. Okay. I got another picture. Albert, of course, is the one who went to Maywood, Illinois. Okay. Let's see if we can hold that up for him. One on the phone. I've got it. I can do it like this. Thank you. That's fine. That's enough. Okay, that's enough. Okay. All right, Albert, Albert uh, was the one whom Mom and Father sent to Chicago when he and Father had a little misunderstanding, not a little one, kind of big one, and he was too big. And they decided he'd better get on his own now. And so they gave him a truck, a, a little, a small truck, and they sent him to my father, my mother's people, the McGees, as I told you, who were, were very prominent at one time in Chicago and in the state of Illinois. I think I told you that. And I told you that her cousin Omer had an undertaking partner and then worked there with him, undertaking, uh, you know, preparing people for funerals. I didn't like that work at all, and so he took his truck and he went to a suburb of Chicago, which is Maywood, which is about 10 miles west of the Loop, and um, started his own hauling business. And of course he had the background from father. But he began to move people, and he developed his business into quite a good business too before he had to let it go. We were all, I think the best thing I can say about Ben is to read to you uh, a couple of things. Um, he was known for his ability to break horses, you know, to take wild horses and break them. Excuse me. He opened Ben's Express of Maywood, Illinois, and by the way, his name was Al Albert Lord, Lord Ben Stroud, is the way he was named. But we called him Ben. Uh, ben. Um, I think probably the best thing I can do is read what my sister Effie had to say about it. And this will tell you best of all, I think, about Ben. She said, Dear Albert, just a few lines to say that I hope you are feeling better and so forth and so on. Um, but you gave us all our first start out into the world. She's talking about us, his sisters and brothers. When we left the safe incubator of Colorado Springs, I remember how frightened I was that night I got off the bus in Chicago and the L was thundering overhead and the traffic whizzing by. I had gotten the time all mixed up uh, since Chicago was on daylight saving time. You had been there to meet me, but you had gone back to Maywood when I did not show up. Then you had to come all the way back to Chicago when I phoned you. How glad I was to see you, and I probably cost you plenty as I had no office skills at all. I could not even answer the, t the phone efficiently, as my ears had never been accustomed to all those foreign accents 
one heard around Chicago. But she found me a place to stay with decent people and helped me find a job. I remember too how you used to sacrifice to send money home, even when you had to sleep in your office on your furniture pads. And I also remember, remember how you used to borrow money every time another one of us Strouds would show up in Chicago. I remember how when I went to Hampton that you sent me a small stand table for a birthday present. I still have that table. I remember how you spent all your time and money trying to do good, like working with the young people in the church and the NAACP and Boy Scouts. You have left an indelible mark in the hearts and minds of many people, far more than you will ever know. It irritated me tremendously when you wrote in one of your newsletters that someone had remarked that the men in our family had all been failures. This was such a stupid and absurd remark which stemmed from colossal ignorance. How does one define success anyway? I would say that it should be the lasting good your life has meant to the others you have touched. Limiting success to the number of dollars one has been able to pile up betrays mental and emotional immaturity. That's something I could say a million times. Limiting success to the number of dollars one has been able to pile up betrays mental and emotional immaturity. Although you must have a certain amount of money to live in comfort and security, just making money will not buy happiness. The two wealthiest families I have known, the Hagermans and the Sachs, were far from happy. That's what makes me think that maybe Mrs. Hagerman had a reason to help us so much. Maybe she just wanted to get out of the house. Maybe she wanted to see something that, that gave her some reason to live. I don't know. And even if you did measure success only in terms of pecuniary profit, you would still come out ahead. First of all, consider where you started, with less than nothing. You had a beaten up little pickup truck, which I don't see how you were able to make it to Chicago with. I say you had less than nothing because you left with a feeling of guilt since you and father had quarreled and you, left and you felt nevertheless you should have remained at home to help with the support of the family. Of course the family was not your responsibility and you had a right to live your own life. Nevertheless you constantly sent to mama much more than you could afford. That was true. After my father went blind I realized by my brother Albert constantly sent us money. That's one thing Mama would count on. Ben was going to send her some money each month. She could count on it. Sometimes it was little, sometimes it was more. But he did it. In spite of all this, you were able to establish a business which was at one time rated in Dun and Bradstreet. Did you know that well? Mm -hmm. At one time, his, his business was rated in Dun and Bradstreet. With this business, you were able to give work and the means of a livelihood to num numerous other persons. To me, this just has to mean greater success than taking a secure job where you can count on a certain amount of regular income for yourself. People like that have risked nothing and have shared their earnings with no one. How could these people be considered more successful than you who have risked the hard-earned money you had to invest in a business which has supported so many others? It makes no difference whether the business is still viable or not. But far far beyond these temporal measures of success, you have kept an unfailing faith and confidence in your religion. I must confess that mine has wavered. Of course I believe that there has to be a supreme being. One has to be an idiot to believe that this great universe just happened. But whether Christianity has the only and all the answers is something I'm not sure of. The essence of it, such as the golden rule and that God is love, seems to me to be all that really matters. And then the rest of the letter doesn't matter about, you know, I'm not going to read the whole letter. But I think that tells about Ben more than anything I could say to you. And that's the kind of human being he was till the day he died. He was a good man and a great man. That was my oldest brother, Ben, and my oldest sister, Kim. And a great writer. And a great writer. Lots of plays well, and stories. Oh, my. And then he also kept that newsletter. He kept that newsletter going. When he went to, when, when my father died, Ben started the newsletter. He was in Chicago. But he figured that we needed to have a way to keep in touch with each other so we wouldn't just fall apart because 
You see, our home environment was what such that we became an entity within ourselves. We were the Strouds, you understand. And my father taught us, you're a Stroud and you're proud. <laughs> That's one of the things he said. And we stuck, stuck up for each other and we were really together, a really together family. Uh, you didn't beat up a Stroud without figuring all the rest of them would get at you. Now that was after Dolphus and Albert. Because when they were first starting out, everybody fought them. And nobody was on their side. But after their experiences, we stood up for each other. Um, we stood up for each other in conversations, too. Don't talk about my sister to me. No, don't do that. Do it to somebody else, but not to me. But we stuck, to, stuck together, and we learned this, the story of Abraham Lincoln, that if you take one person, one finger, you can, you can uh, break it. But you take the whole hand, and it's something hard to break. You know, the story with the sticks. And, the and so we, we, uh, we had a very large togetherness. So Ben wanted to keep it going. So he started the newsletters. Now the newsletters were this. Anything you want to say, you wrote to Ben. You want to get in touch with your sisters and brothers, you just wrote to Ben. You want to say something, you wrote to Ben. And then Ben would put all these things together, these letters he got from us, and he sent each one a copy of all the letters. And so that was the Stroud newsletter. And that went on until he died until he was not able to do it. And a lot of the material, of course, you know that I've used here, I've gotten from Ben's newsletters. So that was just one example. Now, Ben wrote plays and, and stories and poems and things like that because he always had a group of church children that would, would uh, perform his plays. Uh, he was always working with young children. And, um, he wrote many religious plays and put them on. Now, so he was quite quite a man. And he also had this high blood pressure thing. And that, of course, is what really, really brought him down. Also, he never married. And I think he would have been helped a lot had he had a wife to stand by him. In fact, he knew before he died that he should have had a wife because when I was looking after him when he was in the nursing home, you know, he uh, kept telling me, Nina, get yourself somebody. And of course, I never did, but I already had somebody. I had my boy, but he didn't have anyone. And I think that that also hurt him because uh, when he became sick, there was no one to look after him, no one to care, really. And uh, his business was destroyed with fire. But um, there was really nobody to look after him. That was one of the reasons. But anyway, he became sick and uh, with kidney trouble. And that's when Connie, my niece, whom I think you know, Connie, Dolphus' child, found him, went out to see him, and into Maywood, because she was living in Chicago then, and uh, wrote me, and I told him about it, and Lulu decided to go get him bring him home, she did. Brought him back here. And he stayed at their house for a while and then he was on his own for a while and then he was in a nursing home and then Lulu left and I began to look after him in the nursing home. And of course with kidney failure, as he had, you don't recover from that. You don't recover from it now. He was on dialysis for five years and um, that was the time he was in the nursing home. And you just don't recover. You don't recover. Um, they told me when he was in nursing home that he was, his brain would slowly deteriorate, which it did. And um, finally he died. So that was Ben. Now I want to go into Dolphus, who is the next one. Ah, oh, Dolphus. There he is. That's a man you can't see. No. Well, all right, I have a bit of Dolphus. That's it. I don't know if it's better. I don't know if that's a better picture. But Dolphus is the one. Um, I already something he said. I've already written something he said to you. Uh, let me read. This is from. Uh, I don't know what this is from. Anyway, yeah, I guess it's from Colorado College's um, bulletin that they issue about the graduates. I think. Yeah, this is Kelly Dolphus the graduate of 1931. 
Uh, he was former resident of Portland, Oregon. He died June the 24th in Washington, D.C. Mr. Stroud, who came to Colorado Springs as a child from his birthplace of Chandler, Oklahoma, distinguished himself in the area of academic and sports achievement in high school and at Colorado College. There are many accounts of Dolphus Stroud in the newspapers in the early 1920s and 1930s. A book by Ines Hunt, The Story of Mr. Uh, Bristol and the Little Red Schoolhouse, highlights some of the achievements. This is the book they're talking about. Ah. Written by Ines Hunt. Now, this, is this long enough? Okay. Now, right in here, I marked this because I wanted you to see this. This is Bristol School. All of the Stroud children, including Kimball, went to this school, to elementary school. I went to school there first. Did you? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. This school was about four doors from my house, four or five doors. Actually, it was in the next block to us, but it was close to the end of the block. I would say, what, maybe six doors from our house. We hadn't crossed one street, Dale Street, but it was close. This is what our school rooms looked like in those days. I don't know if you can see the ink wells on the desks. And you see the rigid straight rows, and this, these were steel or iron sides there to the desks. And the lids lifted up, and you put your books inside the desks. And you see how many there were. We had large classrooms in those days. That's another thing that worries me about modern education. We had great big classrooms. 30, 40 kids was nothing. The discipline was absolute, no. Um, and we learned so much in our stationary de uh, desk with our hard discipline. We learned hard subjects and we learned well. I think of much of our success, whatever it may be, came from the fact that although we met prejudice, we had very, very good education in those schools. Okay, so they have an account of us, but I don't want to read from that account because it isn't exactly true. <laughs> It's, it's pretty up, you know, it's pretty up so people, so that people will uh, think it's a little better than it was. So, um, as I say, some of his achievements of Mr. Stroud, uh, oh, see, episodes in his life will become a permanent part of the Colorado Springs Public Library. Did you understand what I said? Some of the achievements of Mr. Stroud, of Mr. Stroud's episodes, and, and I guess I mean and episodes in his life, will become a permanent part of the Colorado Springs Public Library in the Minority Oriole History Collection of the Western History Section. In June 1928, Mr. Stroud broke a 25-year record of descending Pike Street. Now, this is, besides all the things he did at school, and I have to say a little bit about those, he did this climbing of Pike Street. The second annual Pike Street or bus marathon run June the 9th was productive of some fast time up and down Pike Street, but the best that day was behind a record made by Dolphus Stroud famed Colorado Springs High School and college athlete back in March of 1928. He graduated from college, Colorado College, as a Phi Beta Kappa, which is, of course, the highest scholastic achievement you can get in college as a society. Um, he was graduated summa cum laude. Now, cum laude means with honor. You have had Latin, I think. And magna cum laude, great honor. And summa cum laude, highest honor. He was the highest person in his class graduating from Colorado College. His major was math and physics. Now, you see when I say he had a major. He minored in uh, Spanish, I believe. The man was a real brain. 
Now, on top of that, he was a great athlete. But Colorado College was so prejudiced, and there was so much prejudice in Colorado Springs, that they would not let any of my brothers, who were all great athletes, all of them, they would not let them on any sport team. They did not get to play baseball. They did not play, get to play basketball, as guys do now, nor football. Uh, they allowed Dolphus to run by himself. A marathon runner runs by himself. Then, of course, they were embarrassed by having a Negro on the team in the sports events. But the office accepted it and went on and decided to be a marathon runner. And he was very, very good. He um, won all of the contests that there were. Now, he trained to go to the Olympics because he wanted to go to the Olympics. He had won everything in Colorado that you could win as a marathon runner. So he wanted to go to the Olympics, and he believed that he could do it, and he could win. And so he trained by going up Pike Street. Now, uh, that is a 14,110-foot peak, and it, it, the Colorado Springs is at the foot of this peak. Um, you can't, I couldn't find a picture of the town and, and the mountain, though, uh, a modern picture. Um, because I took this from a postcard, and I took the pictures I have from a postcard. But he couldn't, um, he trained me by running up and down that mountain. His very best time, and he did that every Sunday, I was going to say that, to train to go to the, to the Boston Marathon. Now, the Olympics of that year were going to try out in Boston. I mean to say in Boston, the United States Olympic hopefuls would try out, and the winner of the Boston Marathon would be sent on to Amsterdam, because in 1928 the Olympics were going to be in Amsterdam. So every Sunday, he would go up that peak and come down it just to train, and he would carry a 30-pound uh, pack on his back to increase his endurance and he carried a pickaxe because he would encounter snow and ice. And he would run up and down the peaks. I think, um, let's see. I want to show you this picture too, because this is the one I love. There is no place, by the way, uh, uh, well, as you know, in Colorado Springs where you can't see this mountain. And this mountain dominates the whole town, and it should. It's a beautiful mountain. If you come out off, if you come from the plains from the Chicago side and you come into the uh, Pikes Peak, you see here is this grand mountain and you've been uh, on the plains all that time. Okay. Uh, he went up the peak. The best time he had was going up in two hours and 45 minutes. I believe that's right. Best time down was 45 minutes. Best round trip was three hours, 29 minutes, and 10 seconds. That time has never been equaled by Indian, anybody, even Indians, the kind of time he made. Now remember, that's 14,110 feet. And remember, you go up so high that you pass timber line. Then no, nothing will grow because your air is too thin. That's another thing, your air gets thin. Your oxygen is just a pit when you get so far. He's, he's running up that mountain. My father used to boast, my son Dolphus <laughs> runs up and down Pike's Peak for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> what fight that is. He said, um, this is what um, the Colorado Springs Gazette and Telegraph had on Sunday, September the 1st, 1957. Much was published in the newspapers at that time, that's 1928, uh, about Trout Pike Peak, Spike Peak climbing exploits, but old clippings have been lost, and at her request, he has written of these climbs to his sister, Nina Pellerin, of 618 North Corona Street, giving her the, the times he made. He is now a resident of Portland, or Oregon. Okay. Um, besides athletic progress, Stroud was a student of exceptional caliber, caliber and was elected to membership in Phi Beta Kappa, et cetera, et cetera. He also attended Harvard University for a year, entering after participation in the Olympic tryouts in Boston. When he wanted to go to Boston to the tryouts, 
nobody in Colorado Springs would send him. His school would not send him because they did not want to be represented by a Negro. So he couldn't get anyone to send him. He had won the Denver Marathon very, very easily, and Tandy was right behind him. Tandy was always with Dolphus when he, even when he was doing athletic things or trying to be. We all did that. I tried to chase him to, to, to guard of God, but Tandy was as good as Dolphus in many, many ways. The only thing is Dolphus was born before Tandy and got more attention. And I kind of think that was too bad for Tandy, and I still do. But <laughs> you have to live under the cloud of somebody else. It's not funny. But he was always competing with Dolphus one way or the other. Dolphus was a big guy. Tandy was a little guy. And Tandy and Bob Dolphus were about a year and a half or two years apart. But um, where was I in this story? I get all mixed up. He went to Boston, anyhow, by trying to hitchhike the whole way from Colorado to Boston. You're talking about almost 3,000 miles, 2,000 some odd miles. And of course, he couldn't do it. He couldn't do that. So when he got to Boston, he was almost too late to get into the, to the trials there, but he was too tired. He was too tired even to finish the race. And that, of course, was terrible for him because he wanted to do it so bad. So as a result, he stayed in Boston. He entered Harvard University and studied there for years. And he used to wait tables to support himself also that being such a, a smart fellow that Boston actually you know, accepted him easily. But they, I'm sure, helped him somewhat, and he came home after a year at Harvard and finished his degree work. So, he was at Harvard for a year, okay? Uh, to me, he wrote to his sister, the greatest pipe speak climb I ever made was December the 31st, 1931. He actually went up that mountain. New Year's Eve, and it was full of snow and ice then. All right. He said, I left a day and a half after the members of the Adaman Club had started their annual climb up the bar trail to set off the New Year's firework display. The Adaman Club went up on top of the Pikes Peak every year at New Year's to set off fireworks for the whole town to see. And they would take three or four days to get up there, you know make a big thing out of it. So, Donna says, I wore nothing but a tracksuit and carried a little pickaxe which saved my life. I went up the cog road. There was a cog train that went up. A cog train is kind of like a cable car. You know, it has cogs on it to help it up some mouth. I carried a little pickaxe and I went up the cog road, the deep cut that follows up the 25% grade along the southeast face of the mountain. During the summer, uh, when the cog road is operating, is filled with snow during the winter months. The snow is frozen solid and has a slick glaze on top. I don't think anyone else has ever climbed the cog road during December, January, and February. If you ever start sliding on this glaze, there's nothing for you but a rapid slide, a shoot out into space, and a landing on sharp granite spurs far below. I had to inch my way around the south end of the mountain at Timberline, 13,000 feet, depending upon the spikes in my track shoes and the pickaxe to keep me from slipping. Then, when I finally made it around, I met the coldest ice-laden wind I have ever faced at Windy Point. It was still more than two miles to the top over that treacherous glaze, and I really didn't expect to make it that day. Somehow, I made it to the top, and when the first members of the Adaman Club arrived about 15 minutes later, they found me huddled behind the portion of the summit house chimney that protruded from the snow. They gave me a blanket and then attacked the snow and ice to dig into the summit house, build a fire, and make coffee. I thawed out, I thawed out, and spent two hours and against the urgings of Ted Tillotson and the other Adamant Club members, headed back home down the easy bar trail this time. That day, I made the trip in four and one half hours, and the down trip in two hours and ten minutes. But to me, it was a much greater accomplishment than the three hour and ten minute round trip made in March of 1928. What's talking about the southeast faces, talking about like this. 
I've been on top of that mountain. I went up my car. <laughs> I didn't do <get> that car. <laughs> and when I got up at the top of it, here's the mountain. There's the summit house up there. Here's the auto highway snaking up there. When I got up on top of that mountain, I wanted to come down some of the way beside that car because I was scared to death coming up that granite. The solid granite, not a tree anywhere, it's just rock. And all of those, you know, you're on the outside, you can see clear down. You know what I'm saying, it's just coming up a cliff in the car. I wanted to come down, I looked all around the edge of that summit, summit. And <laughs> everywhere I could see, I'd have to slide down, you know, I'd just sit out. I don't see how he got up there. I still don't know how he did it, but he did it. And you get at the top, as you know, well, and you can see into five different states at the top of it. Ah, well, he went up there. He went up there in a track suit, and he almost froze to death. So he came down. That's the kind of thing he did that they didn't even recognize. Enough. Uh, his his daughter, Marilyn Kathleen, and I don't want to go into the grandchildren at all because there's too many and there's too much to say. But this was published in the crisis. This was published in the crisis. Okay. And, uh, that's March 19 something. March. March 1977. Yeah. His granddaughter is Marilyn. She is uh, Ida. Is her mother, Ida Martin. And her name is Marilyn Casanova. Mm -hmm. And she wrote this about her father. And it was published in the Crisis. Now, where is it? Here it is. Kelly. I want to be just a little bit, just a little bit too. I'm going to read as soon as we get that on the camera. Okay. And she is a beautiful, a beautiful writer, beautiful writer. But since she wrote this about it, I think that I would like to read just a couple of things to you. In 1926, Kelly D. Stroud had proven himself to be the finest distance runner in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Time after time, he bested all comers in the 5,000 and 10,000 meter races, first locally, then regionally, and then finally throughout the Middle West. At the, every, at, at the end of every one of these events, Kelly heard his name confirm the winner. The city and the country were preparing their champions for the 1928 Games, Olympic Games, to be held in, out in El Amsterdam. And she goes on and talks about it. She says it was simply, she says, the reason he wasn't um, uh, selected for the Colorado Springs contingent was simply because his having been born in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was born in the wrong place. He was born at the wrong time, but I don't think anybody in the United States would have been allowed to go to the Olympics in 1928. A black person. Well, Jesse Owens went in 32. Yeah, but he didn't go in 1928. I don't think so. I think that's just the evolution of our progress in this country, right. of the breaking down of prejudice. So he certainly, I think, would have gotten a certainly much more help if he'd been somewhere else besides Colorado Springs. Anyway, Kelly started out himself in my theory. She says, his time coincided, coincided by the time he got to, uh, to, uh, uh, Boston. Um, there were many experiences during these jobs on the way there some of which were harrowing, and one which nearly ended his life. That was when he went up to Pikes Peak, okay? I didn't want to read that to you. With only six days remaining before the starting date, only six days, Kelly set out from home with $10 and a 50-pound backpack. He believed that he could successfully run, walk, and hike the distance, and with luck, perhaps a hitch ride would come from time to time. But when he got to Chicago and into the East, the newspapers took up his story and they did raise money and help him to get there all the time. And that's how he got there. Um, she says at the end of her story, and this is a good story, she says, when I stood at his hospital bed gazing down at Kelly, because she was there when he died, 
I thought that life had played a curious trick by never allowing me to know the youth who was my father. It's a nice long story. It's a beautiful story. Mm. Um, maybe I'll maybe I'll say this. Six hours before the start of the ra ra race, Kelly arrived in Boston, happier in spirits but bone weary and in need of sleep. He was in time to watch some of the contestants, fresh in appearance, alight from the comfort of the trains which brought them into town. From his resting place in the railroad yards, Kelly was reminded of his own misbegotten image. His last pair of shoes lay beside him. Having refused to go over go on over his having refused to go on over his swollen and bleeding feet. The tracksuit of which he had been so proud at home was only a dingy, colorless concoction made up of discards from other people's homes. His thin, long body seemed more bone than muscle, and what there was of it was covered with road dirt that pressed its weight in on him. His eyes had not regained their normal focus, and then and again he still saw images that he was not sure were real. He had been too tired to look for food, and still was. His stomach kept up a steady tirade against his laggardness. He had never felt so bad, nor so completely engulfed by pains and aches. Though his body taunted him, Kelly tried to concentrate his mind upon the races. To do this, he envisioned those things that he had learned and done on Pike Street Mountain. He approached the starting time, bending down to take the racer's position. Around the track, uh, and his feelings thrust themselves, once around the track, excuse me, once around the track, and his feelings thrust themselves on him. His breath coming in at, at rhythmic gasps, his legs wooden, not lifting from the ground, but shuffling helplessly upon it. The breath of wind against his body as the runners, one by one, winged past him, and ultimately, he felt the tastelessness of defeat where he stopped. He had given his bet and had nothing more to offer. I thought that was just a beautiful piece of writing, and the whole thing was. But that tells the story of his going to Boston. She's got the whole thing done, and uh, what happened to him out there. But he came back home, and he graduated, and he got married. Now, this is the other thing I want to tell you. He wanted a job, of course, we all do. When we go to college, we want a job. And so he asked the dean of men at Colorado College about helping him to find a job. And the dean of men said, sure, you can be a janitor. Now I'm telling you what he was and what he had done. And the best his college could say to him was that he could be a janitor. Now that's when I saw my father a little bit shaken. And I thought, I thought saw his shoulders droop. Because Dolphus was our hope for all of us, because he had so much to give, and he was so good. We all tried to help him to go to college. We all tried to give money to get him his tuition money because of the fact they didn't have scholarships for black people. Sachs scholarship came along there. Dolphus had done it. He made excellent grades. He was a great athlete. He was a great man. And that's what my father got from the school. And so then, and Dolphus, by that time, father was going blind by then and knew he was going. And that's when my father's shoulders began to stoop a little bit. But Dolphus went ahead. Um, he got a job um, in in Georgia, somewhere at a, at a Negro college. And in those days, many of those little small segregated colored colleges were very poor. This was a very poor college. He didn't even get paid on time. Other times it was in goods or services, you know. And he had his young wife, Ida, with him. And they had a couple of children, I believe, in, um, in Georgia. And finally he came back to College Springs, et cetera. He worked with Father for a while. He worked for himself for a while. And then uh, uh, Roosevelt was elected president, and then we started having the CC camp, and you had the other kinds of things that uh, helped all of us who were poor in those days to get through. He became then a counselor in a CCC camp, or maybe he was a teacher. I'll have to get down now to his, uh, his story and tell you what he did, if I see it somewhere. Um, but he worked in CC camps. He went to, oh, it's got to be somewhere. Let's see. Yeah, here we are. Okay. He, uh, 
He taught, he's, he's taught at the State Teachers and Agricultural College in Forsyth, Georgia. He was educational officer of a CCC camp in 1936-38. Okay. He authored a play and a monograph in Spanish on the foundations of black America. This was um, more a history of the black man in America, I mean black people in, in uh, South America, in Mexico. He did research work in Mexico as a Rosenwald Fellow on the contribution of Negroes to the history and life of Spanish American countries. Mm. He coached, yeah, he wrote it in Spanish. He was a good Spanish student. He spoke Spanish fluently. Um, he coached the Black Giants baseball team in Isleta, Texas, and founded the Iceberg Golf Open in Portland, Oregon, where he was an avid golfer. Mr. Stroud was the owner of the Stroud Moving and Storage Company in Portland, and so his survivors included thus, 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 thus. He was married twice. His first marriage was to Ida Vaughn, and his second marriage was to Havana, whose last name I cannot remember to say. Havana Dolphins. Havana Ryan. He had four children by, uh, with his marriage to Ida Vaughn, and one of them was, well, he had five, one was born there. And then there were uh, four, four, there's seven more, I think from his second marriage. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine from his second marriage. So he had a lot of children, so you got a lot of cousins. Okay. And that was Dolphins. Now let me get on, unless you have a question, let me get on to the next one. And that was Effie. Mm -hmm. Now Effie, let's see what well, I've got pictures of her. And then I should, let me get this one and keep this one out so I can always go back to it. F.E. is here. Now, this is F.E. So, obituary, she died April the 12th. Um, F.E. Yes, I think this is the one I read from the obituary. And that's the best way to tell you about her life. She was born in, o in Lincoln County, Oklahoma. She was the last child bo born in Oklahoma. And she went to Colorado Springs High School. She also went to Bristol School. And she, uh, we call it Palmer High now. She graduated with honors and also was an honor graduate of Colorado College. She received her degree in library science from Hampton Institute in Virginia and her Master's of Library Science from Columbia University in New York City. She was a member of the First Pres Presbyterian Church of Colorado Springs when she died, and she was an active member of several civil rights organizations when she was alive. She attended the March on Washington when Dr. Martin Luther King delivered his famous I Had a Dream speech. She was a member of the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority she retired as a supervisory research librarian in New York City and returned to Colorado Springs to live in 1979. She is preceded, was preceded in death by her husband, attorney Clark Frazier, and so forth and the rest of us. Okay, now, the highlights of her life. This was in the Colorado Springs. 1980, March 16th, 1980. There's a picture of her when she came back to home and home every time. And they did a whole, mm -hmm. a whole story. It tells about all the things that she did. Um, she had very high grades all through school. Um, she talks about her father's business and so forth. Um, she got the Henry Sachs Scholarship, and this, I think, is the important thing here in her life. There are many important things. But Henry Sachs, again, was a white man who was a Jew and who found out about Strauss and who, well, I'm not going to read the whole thing, that's a sketch. <laughs> I you could think so other day. But, yeah, he, he found out about the Strouds to 
I think that Effie worked in his household at one time or other as a maid. We all did. We all worked as, as maids. All of us girls coming through that. And so he asked, uh, he knew how well she'd done in school. And uh, he asked her if she was going to go to college, and she said she didn't know. She thought she'd work as a maid for a couple of years, and then she could get the money to go to college. And he decided at that point that he would start giving scholarships. And he said to her that he would give her her tuition money each year according to her grades, that she kept, if she kept her grades up, which of course she did. And so then he gave her the tuition money every year. Mr. Sachs used to come to our house. I remember him clearly. And he played a violin, and he played it fairly well, too. And I don't know what enjoyment he came out, he got coming to this house of these poor, you know, Negroes. And I don't know what enjoyment Miss Hagerman did. But he came. He came every now and then, and he would sit there and play his violin, and he would talk to us, and he got some kind of enjoyment out of it. Anyway, he established this, the Sachs uh, scholarship after his experience with Effie because she did so well in college. She graduated magna cum laude, and she was not admitted to Phi Beta Kappa because she uh, graduated the same year the Dolphins did because he had taken that year away from home you know, at Harvard. And he was elected to Phi Beta Kappa, but she wasn't. And she believes to this day, well, she did believe until she died, but it was because they couldn't stand to have two black people to be Phi Beta Kappa uh, appointees at the same time. And I believe that too, because her grades were so good. Anyhow, um, Sachs, after his experience with Effie, he established the scholarship for all black children who go to school in Colorado, all of them, have an opportunity to get a help from the Sex Foundation. He's dead now, but his foundation is that for that purpose. I tried to get some money to help my son go to school, but they wouldn't let me because he was not a Colorado, Colorado person. <laughs> he wasn't a Colorado person. But there are many Colorado residents, children, young people, students, who have gone to school on Sachs Foundation Scholarship to this day. Now, she went to Hampton, she, Hampton Institute is a black school, as you know, was then a completely black school in Virginia. And uh, of course, when you go to a black school, then you're much more apt to get a job than if you were, in those days, than you were if you went to, in fact, you were going to get a job, almost, if you went to a black school, as, as if you went to college, if you graduated from a black school, because they had the segregated system of schools in the South, and so there it was. However, her first job was in Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, where she got her uh, first uh, uh, job in library science, in, in a, as a librarian. I visited her there. Once I was there, and I know that's where she was at first. Uh, but she wasn't there too long, and then she got a job in New York City, which was quite an upgrade. In Indiana in those days, and in Indianapolis, there was a segregated school system and a segregated library system. So she was there. Now, after she retired from New York City school system, I mean libraries, she uh, lived in, in uh, yeah. Riverdale. Yeah. yeah, Riverdale. And she began to beautify her particular, this is Riverdale Press, and I have to turn it up the other way to show you where Effie has been cited. She was a volunteer. What she did was clean up her neighborhood. The neighborhood was a pretty good neighborhood, but the parking in the front had been um, neglected. It was full of dirt and weeds and trash and stuff. And she cleaned it all up and planted flowers and all that kind of thing, seven or eight blocks there, and made it just a show place for that little suburb. So she was invited to New York for a New Yorker award night awards them. And this is her invitation. And this was, uh, there were five other people, and they, the city of New York um, honored them by having a big dinner and banquet for them at the Waldorf Astoria, 
Nelson Rockefeller was there, and Ethel Kennedy was there, and she had been, she sat at the head at the head table with these people, hmm. and uh, she was honored that way. Let's see. This is her. Oops. This was the program. Let's see. You we'll see her down here. New York, New Yorker for New York Awards. That was after she retired. Here's Ethel Kennedy. Okay. And there I have outlined the column there of what the, was they had to say about it. Ebby Frazier of, F of Fieldstonedale is one of five New Yorkers to be honored with a New Yorker for New York Award by the Citizens Committee for New York City. The award is given for outstanding self-help efforts that have contributed to restoring the city's vitality. She and the other winners will be honored at a gala Valentine evening, Valentine evening at the Waldorf Astoria House Hotel. Mrs. Frazier is symbolic of literally thousands of volunteers who have responded to the city's names. Needs, says Osborne Elliott, chairman of the Citizens Committee by initiating or expanding constructive programs throughout the five boroughs. Mrs. Frazier, who was born in Colorado, is a retired school librarian. For 14 years, she has planted flowers, weeded, watered, and cared for the trees in the malls between West 255th Street and Faraday Avenue along Fieldstone Road. After this work, often this work was done at her own expense. So forth and so forth. So that was her big thing in her life, she felt. And I think it was a very good thing to have in retirement. But the big thing in her life, again, was that she continued the Stroud tradition, as we began to call it. Um, she was a very, very fine scholar, and she contributed a lot to a whole lot of people. And helped us on our way to where we are today, I feel. So that's Effie. I guess I could say a lot more about her, but I don't want to take too much time, Robin, because of the fact that I won't get through. These are the things that I have uh, written down, that were written in some publication or something like that. But she helped all of us, just as did our older sisters and brothers. She helped the younger ones. Remember, she was the big girl at home who had to wash all our diapers. She's the big girl at home who had to help Mama cook all of those terrific meals that that we ate. Because when we ate at home, you know, as I said, it wasn't just one chicken. If you have a chicken, you've got to have at least four. If you make one pie, you got to make four pies. you got all these people. So if you've had a big family, or if you know what big families are like, it was sort of, sort of like cooking for a crowd of people every day. And so you, knew how, you had to work hard, and she did. She went to work for um, white people as a maid when she was very young, maybe 10 or 11, something like that. We all did. And uh, she had to cook and wash for them and clean and so forth and so on. So she did all of that. I remember when I was going to school at Hampton, Effie used to sometimes send me money to help me to get through school. Uh, she paid my way to New York City once just to come to see her. And I got a chance to see New York City. And I've never been back since. But I got a chance to see the great big city. So she was a great sister. Now I'm going to talk about I'm going to skip a little bit around now. Instead of talking straight down, as I did, by uh, when the person was born, the oldest person, then to the youngest, I'm going to skip to James now. And James was our youngest boy. And I'm going to leave out Tandy and Jack, because I, I want to say so much about Jack. And I want to say something about Tandy, too. James doesn't have very much to talk about, and that's why I'm going to talk about him now because he died so soon. You see, he died when he was only 41 years old. And he died of a heart attack. Now, that's the kind of thing that killed most of us, something that has to do with the heart or with the blood, mainly from blood pressure. Um, he was the last boy in our family. My mother and my father had a group of boys and then a group of girls, only two girls, were older than I, and five guys were older than I, five boys. James uh, was the favorite of the Hagerman family. 
he was a cute youngster, very, very cute. He had all of the qualities, all the physical qualities that he wanted. And uh, the Hagermans, Elder, fell in love with him, and they really did spoil James. But even though he was spoiled, he did try his best. When my father, these are the things that I have uh, written down, that were written in some publication or something like that. But she helped all of us, just as did our older sisters and brothers. She helped the younger ones. Remember, she was the big girl at home who had to wash all our diapers. She's the big girl at home who had to help Mama cook all of those terrific meals that, that we ate. Because when we ate at home, you know, as I said, it wasn't just one chicken. If you're having chicken, you've got to have at least four. If you make one pie, you got to make four pies. You've got all these people. So if you've had a big family, or if you know what big families are like, it was sort of like cooking for a crowd of people every day. And so you knew how you had to work hard, and she did. She went to work for um, white people as a maid when she was very young, maybe 10 or 11, something like that. We all did. And uh, she had to cook and wash for them and clean and so forth and so on. So she did all of that. I remember when I was going to school at Hampton, Effie used to sometimes send me money to help me to get through school. Uh, she paid my way to New York City once just to come to see her. And I got a chance to see New York City. And I've never been back since. But I got a chance to see the great big city. So she was a great sister. Now I'm going to talk about, I'm going to skip a little bit around now. Instead of talking straight down, as I did, by uh, when the person was born, the oldest person, then to the youngest, I'm going to skip to James now. And James was our youngest boy, and I'm going to leave out Tandy and Jack, because I, I want to say so much about Jack, and I want to say something about Tandy, too. James doesn't have very much to talk about, and that's why I'm going to talk about him now, because he died so soon. You see, he died when he was only 41 years old, and he died of a heart attack. Now, that's the kind of thing that killed most of us, something that has to do with the heart or with the blood, mainly from blood pressure. Um, he was the last boy in our family. My mother and my father had a group of boys and then a group of girls. Only two girls were older than I, and five guys were older than I, five boys. James uh, was the favorite of the Hagerman family. He was a cute youngster, very, very cute. He had all of the qualities, all the physical qualities that he wanted. And uh, the Hagermans, Elder, fell in love with him, and they really did spoil James. But even though he was spoiled, he did try his best. James was only what? I was 10, Lulu was 12, James was only 14 years old, and he was the oldest guy at home for a while. We depended on the men in our family to take care of us, and they did. We did the housework, we did the work, which we thought was harder than what they were doing, maybe it was. But they are the ones who made the money, the main money for us. And they were the ones who were the backbone of our family, they were the protectors, they were the provider. And uh, so there he was, supposed to, well, we couldn't be responsible, he couldn't be responsible for us, and we didn't expect it. But he drifted away. He, did, he got through high school. No, he didn't quite get, get graduate. Later on, he found it that he had enough credits to get. On top of that, James was not the scholar that we were the kindest of. He was a physical person. He had a lot of physical ability. His hands were wonderful. He was a very good mechanic. When he was about 12 or 13, I guess it was, he built himself his own car, his own automobile. He found a um, piece of, uh, of an engine and another piece of engine and put them together, uh, automobiles. And he was able then to build himself one. He made it out of uh, the body out of orange crates. <laughs> and he put in all the pipes and everything else he was supposed to put in and it ran. Because he used to charge us 10 cents to take us to church. <laughs> he was a wonderful guy. Anyhow, um, he left home and he he was brought up, of course, in the Depression is when he was a, a, a young guy, when he was in his teens, he was in the Depression. You can tell that from when he was born. 1925, when he was 10 years old, we were really not, 35, he was 20. We were deep in Depression. 
And he was a hobo for a while. He went from place to place on freight trains. And he used to tell us when he came into Colorado Springs about where he had been and what he had done. When he was a little fella, a kid growing up, he used to take the younger kids up in the hills with him, the foothills behind our house. You know, the foothills that go up to the mountain. And we used to stay up there maybe a day. And he'd build a fire and we'd have apple cactus to eat. That the cactus has a plant on it. Some cactuses do. They have a fruit. And he called it apple cactus. And we'd eat that. Um, he was different from the rest of us. He was very different. Um, anyway, he finally found a woman that he settled down with, his wife, and he uh, went to San Diego and they got a, a place, Saxony Arms, to manage. And that James was only what? I was 10, Lulu was 12, James was only 14 years old, and he was the oldest guy at home for a while. We depended on the men in our family to take care of us, and they did. We did the housework, we did the work, which we thought was harder than what they were doing, maybe it was. But they are the ones who made the money, the main money for us. And they were the ones who were the backbone of our family, they were the protectors, they were the providers. And uh, so there he was, supposedly, well we couldn't be responsible, he couldn't be responsible for us and we didn't expect it. But he drifted away, he, did, he got through high school, no he didn't quite get, get graduate. Later on, he found it that he had enough credits to get. On top of that, James was not the scholar that we were, the kind of scholar. He was a physical person. He had a lot of physical ability. His hands were wonderful. He was a very good mechanic. When he was about 12 or 13, I guess it was, he built himself his own car, his own automobile. He found a um, piece of, uh, of an engine and another piece of engine and put them together. Uh, automobiles and he was able then to build himself one he made it out of uh, the body out of orange crates and <laughs> he put in all the pipes and everything else he was supposed to put in and it ran because he used to charge us 10 cents to take us to church <laughs> he was a wonderful guy anyhow um, he left home and he he was brought up of course in the depression is when he was a, a, a young guy when he was in his teens he was in the depression you can tell that from when he was born. 1925, when he was 10 years old, we were really not, 35, he was 20. We were deep in depression. And he was a hobo for a while. He went from place to place on freight trains. And he used to tell us when he came into Colorado Springs about where he had been and what he had done. When he was a little fellow, a kid growing up, he used to take the younger kids up in the hills with him, the foothills behind our house you know, the foothills that go up to the mountain. And we used to stay up there maybe a day. And he'd build a fire and we'd have apple cactus to eat. That the cactus has a plant on it. Some cactuses do. They have a fruit. And he called it apple cactus. And we'd eat that. Um, he was different from the rest of us. He was very different. Um, anyway, he finally found a woman that he settled down with, his wife, and he uh, went to San Diego and they got a, a place, Saxony Arms, to manage. And he was managing this, he wasn't there at that place. He was managing, though, the Saxony Army Arms um, a project when he died. It was an apartment house.